perfecting church assembled in the house this morning and to the perfecting church assembled online, God bless you and welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the day the Lord has made and in it we shall rejoice and we shall be glad. I invite you guys to do your evangelist thing, those of you who are joining online and I give you permission, those who are in the sanctuary, to take the next two or three minutes and share the post. Tag a friend, invite somebody who you believe needs to hear a word from the Lord today. We'll give you just a few minutes to do that, and then we're going to dive in. Uh, today's message is continuing in the series, Child. It is the master's process for his masterpiece. Amen. And uh, I'm sitting there worshiping and getting prepared to deliver this word. And did any of y'all watch the 18 when you were little? Yeah. Yeah, anybody else watch the 18 with VA Rockets and all of that? Uh, there's always a scene in a movie where Hannibal, who was kind of like the leader of that team, would say, I love it when the plan comes together. And I just felt like the Spirit of God <laughs> was just reveling in the moment. I love it when a plan comes together. Nobody else thought it would work out right. All of the odds were stacked against them. But the spirit of the living God, the master strategist, he who knows the end from before the beginning is sitting satisfied, declaring, I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> Amen. So if you don't mind, I'm going to just pray one more, one more again, one more time. Um, Father, we just uh, acknowledge you. God, you're so good and you're so gracious and you're so strategic in the ways you move in and through our lives. We acknowledge that we do not stand here today because we were good enough, because we were smart enough, because we were wise enough. But we acknowledge that everything we enjoy, every benefit, every breakthrough, every blessing is not because we were so good, but because you, sir, are so good. And you're so kind, and you're so loving, and you're so faithful. And I yield today, God, I pray that the word that is declared is your word. That you would use my voice and cause my thoughts to align with heaven so that Every word, every intimation, and every utterance is an expression of your will and extends and causes greater influence for your kingdom. Thank you for the preparation of our hearts, our minds, and our lives for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen family. For those who don't know me, I am Minister Latoya Aberhart, and I am so humbled thrilled to stand before you this morning. And I invite you to join me in Ephesians 2.10 this morning. Again, we're continuing in the series Chopped, and it is the master's process for his masterpiece. In Ephesians 2.10, when you find it out of the New Living Translation, reads, for we are God's masterpiece. We are are God's masterpiece. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> you and I, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Amen. I love the thought of being somebody's masterpiece. Amen. The sovereign the Alpha and Omega, the bright and morning star, the one who engineered the heavens and called the stars by name and created all of Earth's splendor and all of the glory that we see on a beach or in a forest or in a mountaintop or in the depths of the ocean says, out of all of those things, out of all of those works, out of all of the expanse of my majesty, he looks at you, he looks at me, and he says, you are my masterpiece. I love that. That's so comforting and it's so encouraging. 
encouraging. God is not waiting on me to get better. He says, I am his masterpiece. God is not waiting on me to get it together. He says, I am his masterpiece. God is not waiting on me to act right or to do right. He says, right here today, in this moment, you, son, you, daughter, are my masterpiece. Out of the Amplified, it goes into a little bit more depth. It says, we are his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and ready to be used for good works, which God pre in advance, right, prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. We have any artists in the house or any designers, any, anyone who has a creative skill set or anyone who's ever had to manage a project from inception to completion. If, if you are of that bent, then you know what it is to have something be called a masterpiece. My husband is, a, is kind of a renaissance man and he has several different hobbies that he works on. And from inception to application, from start to finish, he's one who will literally be up at night thinking about the next piece or the next part or the next element of design to bring about the, the desired outcome. And I, I watch him and honestly, I marvel. Um, we are wired very differently. But that creative bent in him is one that keeps him up night, laboring over each piece and each part of the design. See, that's the mind of the designer. Scripture tells us God never sleeps and he never slumbers. Do you know that you are on, your, on God's mind at this very moment? You are on God's mind at this very moment. That God himself literally lays up while you're resting he is thinking of the next piece and the next part and the next process of his designed plans for you. While you're up worrying about your children, God's already worked that out. He's already figured it out. It says he knows the end from before the beginning and grammatically that doesn't make any sense to us. What could be before the beginning? God. God. And he calls us his masterpiece. For some of you who, who cook and, and, and for the chefs in the house, you know what it is to labor over a masterpiece. I'll bring the Renaissance man into the message again today. And I'll share with you a little bit of our details. I honestly think the reason I don't attend therapy regularly is because I sit in a pea cell. And every now and then I get to stand up here and talk to you and God just sorts some things out. So y'all know a lot of my business. Amen. So um, we were married very young. And for me, cooking was never a joy. Amen. <laughs> I cooked because I had people in the house that needed to eat. And because I was the one home, oh, okay, I I'll feed you guys. And if I'm honest, for the first several years of my marriage, I literally had a grocery list that was on repeat time and basically picked up the same four or five items that we were going to prepare. I tried to rotate it, you know, so it didn't get too boring. But my grocery list was on repeat because cooking for me was a chore. It was something that I did because people were expecting it and they needed to eat. Here comes this renaissance man, though, and, and some kind of way, a few years after we were married, I guess he got tired of the grocery list on repeat. He himself took to the kitchen. And it's a completely different experience working with someone who sees cooking as a joy and not a chore. For instance, he would lay up at night and think about the theme for his meal. And I would be like, what is wrong with him? Right? That didn't make sense to me because I didn't have the mind of the designer. But there would be a theme for the meal, and everything would be prepared just so. Not just going to the market and getting the produce and the seasoning and the ingredient, but even looking at the cookware and picking the best pieces, the piece that would be most well suited. 
executed to bring about the result that he himself desired. And it wasn't enough just to labor over all of the intricate details of the meal, but he would prepare it, and he would plate it, and he would serve it, and then he does this thing where he wants to watch you. <laughs> because he would take great joy and pleasure in your response to what he served. That's the mind of the designer. That's the mind of the one who works and labors over a masterpiece. That is the mind of the one who saw you from before the beginning and prepared in advance good works and a good life that you would walk in and that you were to live. He set paths and provision and promises in place from A to Z. Why? Because our God doesn't serve leftovers. Amen. That's a big comfort for me. I'm not a big fan of leftovers. I do what I must, but God himself doesn't serve leftovers. He's not recycling somebody else's plan for you. And he's not asking you to look to your left or look to your right and see what they did and follow after that course because God doesn't serve leftovers. The other thing I'll tell you, and this may be a disappointment to some of you who had parents who would cut the corners off your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and give you exactly what you desired for your meal. I came out of a house that said, this is what's being served. You will eat or you will go hungry. But God is not a short order cook. And what I mean by that is the kingdom is not like Burger King. You cannot have it your way. And listen, I know we, we've tried. I, I, I puzzle and pour over the different translations and footnotes in scripture to see if there is an escape clause. If there's a way I can get out of this. And I haven't found one. I haven't found any. God doesn't serve leftovers, but he's not a short order cook either. God knows what is best for you and what is best for me. And the designer, the master chef, the God who is perfect on purpose and on time all the time is serving, delivering, providing his best for you. Amen. God's plans and processes are unique, they are strategic, and they are specific. I, I, I marvel over, because I, I'm in a relationship with some creative types. Um, our daughter has a degree in fashion design. And I, I would marvel over how she would select a fabric. And, and, oh my goodness, I hated taking her shopping. Because my mind was, let's just go in and let's just pick something out. And this is the store we're at, so we'll get whatever it is they're offering. But that is a no-go for the creative type. And so if we got to start in South Jersey and wind up in New York, so be it, because there's something specific that she has in mind. There's something specific that God has in mind for each of us. And listen, it says we have the mind of Christ, but we don't always begin there. There are things that God knows about you that you haven't even considered. There are things that God has in store for you that are not yet a gleam in your eye. If I'm honest with you today, there are places and spaces I inhabit that I look back and say, how in the world did I get here? Those are the but God moments. Again, because God is strategic and God is specific. I remember um, even talking with um, a, a woman I love dearly about what it was like the very first time we sat in the perfected church. And I remember listening to pastor's message. It was on the family. And I remember they're sitting thinking, he must have bugged our car this morning. Because we were literally um, on, on the brink of tussling on our way to church. We were the family that got it together just before we got out of the car so we could smile and nod when the ushers gave their greeting. But I remember sitting and listening to the invitation.
attention, and, and it was almost like something magnetic pulled my husband and myself to the front. It was almost like there was such a powerful draw, I can't explain it, but by the Spirit of God. And I remember telling my aunt when I got home what that experience was like, and her only response was, God is the master chess player. Amen. See, what nobody else in New Jersey knew is that my family and I had been out of organized church and organized religion for about three years. That we had decided we would love God wholeheartedly, but we weren't real keen on dealing with his people. I love y'all today. <laughs> but, but that is where we were. The devil thought he had us. He, he thought that it was over. But just when he went for his kill shot, God intervenes and says, Child. Why? Because his plans for each of us are strategic and specific. And rarely does God give you the next 40 years overnight. But it is literally line by line and precept upon precept, we move from faith to faith and from glory to glory, one obedient step of the time, at a time, but I want to encourage you to let you know, listen, God's already seen the end of this thing. He's already seen the end of this thing. Right where you are, right where you're struggling, right where you're questioning, right where you're challenged, God's already seen the end of this thing. God is, God, is a God, of, God is a God of process. He's a God of process. He is strategic in his promises, but he's also just as strategic in the process that he uses to manifest them in each of our lives. If you notice, the children of Israel did not wake up in the promised land the night after the Passover, right? There was a process by which he led them, name by name, family by family, tribe by tribe, and even generation by generation into his promised land. God has a process in each of our lives. Yes, there are promises. Yes, there are good works that he in advance prepared. But how many of you know my 23-year-old my, my self is not ready to walk into what my 43-year-old self will encounter in the next 12 months? Right? So there's preparation that God goes through in our lives. Again, individual, specific, strategic. Don't look at your neighbor and envy their process. Mm. They're not your designer. Amen. And don't look behind you and think, how, how, could, how could this have been better or how could this have happened? Trust that the master designer, the one who has a master plan, is heavily invested in his process of manifesting his glory in our individual and collective lives. You see, with the masterpiece, you don't just throw some stuff on a canvas and see where it lands. That's not how the masterpiece works. God is heavily invested in the process of manifesting his glory. And let me make a note there, it's his glory, not our own. It is his glory, not our own. There are some great benefits to being found in the glory and in the presence of God. But don't ever get to the place where you want to take ownership and believe that it belongs to you. God still says, my glory I will give to none of them. Amen. So he is heavily invested in the process of manifesting his glory in our individual and our collective lives. And, and process is a part of everything the sovereign God does. I think about, um, we, we have a puppy in our life now. <laughs> and it doesn't belong to us. I'm not quite there yet. But I've watched this, uh, these young people go through a process of training this puppy. And they started with the puppy using the little blue chucks to teach them how to, you know, use the facilities indoors, not on the carpets. 
and they went from the blue chucks to taking them outside, right? And so now we all understand that when this puppy stands by the door, it's time to go, right? But that didn't start day one. It was a process. And God has a process for each of us. We live in a microwave society. I know you've heard that. But our God is a big fan of a crock pot. Some of the overnight stuff, right? It takes a while. It's got to sit and simmer. And it's not going to be good if you interrupt it. That's not how divine design works. Amen. Let's take a look at um, Jeremiah 29, 11. And Jeremiah 29, 11 is a very familiar scripture to us. Jeremiah 20, 29, 11, I'm going to read it to you out of the Amplified. But in Jeremiah 20, 11, 29, 11, the scripture reads, for I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace, not for evil. To give you hope in your final outcome. And if you want to write this down, we think, but God knows. We think, God knows. Jeremiah 29 Starts and it's a letter. If actually, if you you know, if your Bible has the chapter headings, it tells you it's Jeremiah's letter to the captives. God wasn't speaking to this pe to a people that were in the midst of great flourishing and abundance. God wasn't speaking to a people making six figures and living in houses they did not build and eating fruit that they did not sow for. God is literally speaking to a people in the midst of captivity. God is speaking to a people in a hard place. God is speaking to people in a challenging space. Yes, yes. I know some of us know what it is to be captive. Amen. What it is to be in a hard place, yes. in a dry place, in a dark place. But in the middle of that darkness, in the middle of that place where the natural tendency is to despair, God speaks a word and God through the prophet says, I know the plans I have for you. God still knows the plans he has for you. Perhaps the last opportunity did not work out the way you wanted it to. God still knows the plans he has for you. Perhaps September 27th, you are not where you thought you would be in 2020. God still knows the plans he has for you. Perhaps you feel like I've messed it up and there's no way in the world that I could get back the thing that I had before. But today I am telling you, God still knows the plans that he has for you. He hasn't changed his mind. He knew you was going to mess up before the opportunity presented itself. And he's not changed his mind. See, we think, and, and listen, the thoughts of man apart from the wisdom of God are dangerous. It is dangerous to lean to your own understanding. Because according to our own understanding, we ought to do things and say things and go places and make plans that are so contrary to what it is the master has already ordained. My, my, my prayer as of late is, God, help me to think your thoughts after you. Help me to think your thoughts with you. You said I have the mind of Christ. God, help me not to lean to my own understanding because I don't want to miss you, God. I don't want to miss you. This is when we begin to desire that word more than our necessary food because I know I need God's word to get God's thoughts because apart from God's thoughts, I'm on my own and it is perilous to be on your own in this season. See, I, I think there are some things I think about my family. There are some things I, I think about my children. There are some things I may think about my spice, spouse and my vocation and my education. But God knows. So when it comes down to a decision between the two, when he's giving me instruction, I don't have time to reason about it according to my own understanding. I better do the thing that he says. Why? Because my thoughts are not his 
and it shall be. And then my actions and my thoughts and my declarations and my prayers begin to align themselves with what it is the Father had in mind the whole time. And the Spirit of God can sit back and say, I love it. God says, I know what is required for the full manifestation of my purposes and my glory in your life. God has ways that we would not often go. And he has roads that we would not travel. I am um, still heavily GPS dependent. I like to punch in the location and see what the options are. But once I punch it in, listen, I'm tied to the GPS. If it says go right, I'm going right. If it says go left, I'm going left. I'm back to that Renaissance man that I married. He looks at the GPS, but he has his own mind about a faster way to get there. Now, why would it tell me to go this? I don't know. I don't know the mind of the GPS. But if I'm going to rely on it, then i got to listen to what it says. Somehow, by the grace of God, we always get to our point of destination. But the idea is that God can see further than we can see. He knows more than we could ever know. And he loves deeper than we ever will. So we can confidently trust in the steps and the path and the process that he has ordained for our lives. I was out walking this week and in the middle of, of walking. I, I just heard God say, you are not what you think. And you are not what they say, but you are what I know. And that struck me. I, I, I'm not who or what I think I am. At the beginning of 2020, I had a very different picture and vision of where I would be and what I would do and where I was going than I do in September. Amen. I'm not what I think. But he added to that, you're not what they say. I thank God for godly counsel and the men and women that God sends to breathe his word and instruction into my life. I know I need that. But there are other voices, other shapers, other people with ideas and thoughts according to their understanding. And God has to kind of remind me, you're not what they say. But God himself, the sovereign, declares, you are what I know. And he goes further. He says, every inspiration and every revelation is designed to cause me to see as he sees so that I can become what he says. God doesn't do small talk. God doesn't just, you know, speak words to shoot the breeze or to feel the space or a lull in a conversation. But every word of God is intentional. Every word of God is intentional. Every word of God is intentionally, uniquely tailored for you. Why? Because he wants to give you his thoughts. Why? So that his thoughts can become your ways. Why? So that he can reveal and uncover and unveil the glory that he knew was resident in you the entire time. But there's a process involved. We get very excited about promise. But I want y'all to get just excited about process. We get real excited about the promise 2020. Glory to God. But I want you to get just excited, just as excited about God's process. Because the process is what it takes to get me into promise. And I'm going to be excited all the way there. Yes and amen. I will rejoice and I will give thanks in all things. Because this is his will for me in Christ Jesus. And so if, even if it looks like it's going all the way left, i got to trust the one, the divine designer. I gotta trust the master chef. I gotta trust the one who knows the plans he has for me. I gotta stop leaning to my own understanding. And listen, it's tempting. When things go left, it's tempting. When everything around me is failing, it's tempting to give up, to walk away, to resort to plans B through Z because my, my plan A don't look like 
like it's working, but God still knows the plans he has for you and for me and every one of his words, all of his plans, every process he has in mind is designed to unveil the glory that is resident on the inside of us. And I don't know about you, but if I look at the world right now, there is a need for an unveiling of the sons and the daughters of God. Because the sons of men and the daughters of men and the wisdom of men is failing at every turn. And so there's a glory in you. There are works that God created for you. There is a plan and a promise with your name on it that is not only going to bring great fruit and increase in your life, that's great, but give greater glory to our king and his kingdom. Hallelujah. And that's what this world requires now. Amen. Amen. Get ready to close here. Wow, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, God. If, if you're taking notes, I need you to write this one down. And I'm just going to apologize to the video guy because I was supposed to give him a cue about when he was going to write stuff down. But praise God, he caught on. He caught on. Write this one down. This is our final point. That confidence in the master causes greater peace in and surrender to his will. Confidence in the master causes greater peace in and surrender to his will. Luke 138 out of the Passion Translation, if you'll go there with me and we'll close here. And Luke chapter one is the story of um, Gabriel visiting. First he starts with Elizabeth and Zachariah, I believe it is, he goes to visit them and announces the birth of uh, John the Baptist, that this old, barren, dried up couple was going to have a baby. And then he goes to visit Mary, this young virgin, teenage Mary, who is betrothed to Joseph, um, perhaps picking out decorations for the home they'll share together and making plans for what the ceremony will look like and getting a guest list and invitations together and there is this divine interruption where the angel announces that you are blessed and highly favored for you will be the mother of the son of God and I can only imagine all of the different thoughts that I would have encountered had that announcement come to me not only had she never known a man but this might be a problem for Joseph, right? I, I, I'm supposed to be engaged and preserving myself, and so it's going to look very strange when I turn up pregnant and say, this is the son of God, right? But nevertheless, Mary's response was, this is amazing. I will be a mother for the Lord. As his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. May everything you have told me come to pass. And the angel left her. We too often read scripture with the end of the book in mind. In other words, we've already lived it. We know what happened in Genesis and we get to read what happened in Revelation. Mary didn't know there would be a revelation, right? The people on the pages that we read had to live this. And for her, this teenage young woman, having this divine interruption from heaven, for her response to be not only this, that this is amazing, but I accept whatever he has for me. I choke sometimes on those words, right? Because God is sovereign, and he's not a short order cook, and this is not Burger King. I don't always know which way he's going to go. There are things that I would have done differently had the pen been, been held in my hand. But the real heart of a servant, the real heart of a disciple, one disciplined to the ways and the manner and the lordship of the living God is whatever he has. 
whatever he has for me. I'll accept whatever he has for me. So when things look like I want them to look like, I still say yes and amen. And when things go a, a different way, a way I wasn't expecting, I'll still say yes and amen. And when I, I, I look through the pages and the chapters and the verses and the characters in scripture and we see them so clearly, we have the, the David and Goliath, then we have the Daniel and the lion's den, but right in the middle of that, there's also Job. And Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That is the heart of a servant that says, whatever he has for me, I'll accept him. God is specific. God is strategic. And God is intentional. And none of us is present today by accident. Amen. God saw this day before the foundation of the earth. And he saw you in this day before the foundation of the earth. And it's mind-blowing to think that out of all of the works of creation, he would look on you and he would look on me on this day at this time. Say you are my 